our new series. If you flick back in your mind to the Sunday meeting that was our first Sunday meeting in January, 2nd of January 2022, we had a wonderful time of worship in which we used the songs, one of my favorite songs, I'm going to see a victory. And Wayne Parsons, off the back of that, got up and prayed. And he said this, he opened with the line, we are believing God for many victories across the Solent in 2022. And for me, that was a real moment in God. So for me personally, for us as a church family, now is a time to take fresh courage, to take huge lungfuls of faith in God. And so we're going to turn in our Bibles to Joshua chapter 1 this morning. And over the next few weeks, we're going to unpack uh, the first seven or eight chapters of the book of Joshua as a vehicle to help us understand how to take ground, how to press in both individually and together as a people into all that God has got for us. So Joshua 1. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land that I am giving them. I promised you, I promise you what I promised to Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land that I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, the Euphrates River in the east, and the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as I live. For as I I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess the land I swore to their ancestors that I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, either turning to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in all you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. About three years ago, so pre-COVID days, Janet and I got a phone call one day. I took the call from an international prophet, someone who hears God in quite remarkable and significant ways. And they said they wanted to come and see us. And uh, they gave us a fairly tight time frame of a week or so. And uh, they got my attention because they're always worth listening to. But my diary was completely full. So I had to say, sorry, um, we, we can't make it. And the person persisted and said, no, I really need uh, to come and talk to you. So we made about half an hour or so for a nice English cup of tea because we thought that they just wanted a nice cosy chat. And what we got was not a nice cosy chat. Um, what we got was a powerful prophetic word. And uh, this person repeated, it's repeated three times in the passage, but if you look right through the story of Joshua, the words be strong and uh, courageous are repeated five times and be strong and very courageous is repeated twice so all in all seven times and this person prophesied over Janet and I five times be strong and courageous and then twice be strong and very courageous and uh, looking back that was a word from God that we really needed to hear 
And I really do believe at the start of 2022, it's a word that I need to refresh myself in, but also speak over us as a local church. God wants to say to you individually, and he wants to say to us as a church community, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. So we emerge from two years of COVID to say we need to take huge lungfuls of fresh faith and fresh courage. Now to give the background to this passage here, Joshua has just lost his spiritual father. He's in mourning, he's in grief. The whole community is in grief. I can still remember the day my dad died like it was yesterday. I'd been a pastor for three or four years. This was back in 2003. And I'd been asked to go to, the, um, to America for the first time. And we'd spent the previous day, the Sunday, with my mom and my dad, my brother, his wife, their kids, our kids. And the following day, literally, as my plane took off from Heathrow, my dad collapsed in the street. Now, by the grace of God, when I got back the following week, he was just about still alive. But he never regained consciousness, and he died a few days later. Now, why am I telling you that story? Well, it's a reminder to me that we need, as people, to be real about grieving our losses. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, we're told that the people of Israel mourned for Moses for 30 days. We've all, to a greater or a lesser extent, suffered loss over the last couple of years. I was speaking to someone just the other week and they said this to me, it feels like I just lost the last two years of my life. But after this period of mourning and recognition of loss, we then need to find strength and courage in God in large measure for the challenges ahead of us. After the period of mourning, we get to Joshua 1 and God's word to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. Just before we look at the passage, I want to put it into some sort of context so we understand how Joshua's got to this moment and how God's people have got to this moment. Of course, over the previous 40 years, you get the story recorded in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Israel has been brought out of slavery in Egypt by the power of God. They're rescued from Pharaoh's armies through the Red Sea. God provides for them supernaturally food in the desert, drink in the desert. God gives them his laws, the Ten Commandments, through Moses on Mount Sinai. God promises them a land flowing with milk and honey which to me sounds quite sticky and uninviting, but in the context, it's a picture, isn't it, of a language to say it's going to be a really good place to live. And the other piece of the jigsaw that you have to have in your mind is that this is second time around for Joshua. He's now a pretty old guy, and Israel has spent 40 years getting from Egypt to this point on the edge of the promised land. Wind the story back 38 years. And 38 years earlier, they had sent spies into this promised land. 12 spies. Joshua was one of those spies. The majority report comes back from 10 of the 12 spies Yes, the land is wonderful. It really is flowing with milk and honey. But the military challenge is going to be too difficult. There are too many obstacles and too many giants for us to overcome. But Joshua and his friend Caleb, they were uh, 
able to submit a minority report, yes, the land is good, yes, the challenges are enormous, but most importantly, God has promised. But because of the overwhelming weight of opinion against Joshua and Caleb's report, Israel spends the next 38 years in the wilderness, waiting for an unbelieving generation simply to die out. Only Joshua and Caleb survive. 40 years of wilderness wandering because of lack of faith and a lack of courage. And now, as you see on the map, they stand on the edge of the promised land, where the circle is on the map. And really, I've got just three simple points for us this morning. First of all, I want us to understand Moses is not enough. In fact, that's the central point, not just of this morning's preach, but for this whole series. Moses is not enough, and I'll explain that in a minute. Second, we need to understand the power of the presence of God. And third, we need to understand that our courage needs to be anchored in the word of God. So first of all, Moses is not enough. Moses, says God, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, Israel's previous leader is an amazing man. He wasn't perfect earlier in his life. He'd actually killed somebody because he's so angry about the injustice of slavery in Egypt. But God shapes Moses to be a remarkable guy. He's described in Numbers 12 as the humblest man in all the earth. He led Israel out of slavery. He parts the Red Sea with his staff. The staff is the sign of God's authority. He strikes the rock with the staff and supplies water for a nation in the desert. He speaks with God on Mount Sinai. He prays to God when Israel messes up and starts worshipping a golden calf. God hears Moses' prayer. But Moses never gets to go into the land. He disobeyed God. There comes a moment where Israel needs water a second time. And this time God tells Moses very clearly to speak to the rock, not to strike it. But probably in anger, he disobeys God, strikes the rock. It may look trivial to us, but it's actually massive because he misrepresented God and God's character and God's nature to God's people. But actually, there's something much bigger happening on a bigger scale because Moses is a picture of of the law. The law will never ever be enough to bring us into the full blessing of the promises of God. Only Jesus can do that. And this is where Joshua comes in. Because Joshua, we need to get this to really understand this series and this book. Joshua is a picture first and foremost of Jesus. His name actually is the same name as the name of Jesus. The Hebrew word Yeshua, when it's translated into Greek, it becomes Jesus, Jesus in its English spelling. We need to understand Jesus outtrumps Moses. Joshua outtrumps Moses every time. Jesus is better than Moses. The law, John tells us in John 1.17, is given through Moses. But God's unfailing love and faithfulness comes to us through Jesus Christ. The promised land, receiving promises from God, always comes from Joshua, never from Moses. And translated for us today as God's people, Jesus is the true and better Joshua, hence the series title. Joshua is a picture of the law. Jesus, jo sorry, Joshua, Moses is a picture of the law. Sorry, get that right. 
Moses is a picture of the law. Joshua is a picture of promises fulfilled. But Joshua points us to a greater character. He points us to Jesus, who is the perfect fulfillment of all the promises of God. Just look at this picture. This is dear old Lewis Hamilton in a go-kart as a young boy. Now look at this. This was his car this year. That points to this. The toy points to the real thing. The little car, the toy that Lewis Hamilton had when he was just 12 years old, was great as far as it went. I bet Lewis really enjoyed driving it. But it points towards something that is much more substantial in the future. It's a foreshadowing of what is to come. In a similar way, Joshua points us to Jesus, someone who is greater and glorious, just like the Formula One dwarfs and pales the go-kart into insignificance. Joshua points us to the reality of all that God has promised us as his dearly loved children. Not by trying to keep the rules, not through the law, but because of what Jesus has already done. We need to understand, as God's people, we live out of identity, not out of performance. I'll say that again. So important we understand, as the people of God, we live out of identity, not out of performance. Let me read a couple of verses for you from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 7. The Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were uh, more numerous than other nations. You were the smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you and he was keeping the oath that he swore to your ancestors. What's God saying to Israel there? Why do I love you? I love you because I love you. It's as simple as that. The Bible uses the word grace to describe that unfailing love. His kindness, his affection, his deep, inexplicable, unmovable, overwhelming love expressed to us, not through a list of rules, but through a person, through Jesus. You know, we cannot keep the law. We never were able to keep the, the law. But Jesus kept it perfectly. He was completely faithful to everything God asked of him. Maybe you're looking in this morning. You're just exploring this whole Christian faith thing. Can I say this to you? Living in relationship with God is not about trying hard and trying to keep the rules. Almost every person who's not yet a Christian that I ever meet thinks that that's what Christianity is fundamentally about. I need to keep the Ten Commandments. Don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother. Now don't get me wrong, they're all really good ways to live. But keeping those laws will never put you in right relationship with God. The only person who can keep those laws is Jesus. And so what God offers you this morning is not a life of trying hard but always falling short, but a new power to live by through relationship with Jesus. Those of us who are already Christians, God is calling you this morning. God is calling me to fresh faith and courage. He is not saying, try harder. Doesn't work like that. He says, I am in Christ. I have been united to the true and better Joshua. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. We sang it this morning. And as we are united with Christ, we live out of that identity. And just very quickly as I close, 
the two other things. Number one, the power of the presence of God. Did you notice? After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua. I will be with you as I was with Moses. That's remarkable when you look at the life of Moses. Boy, God was with Moses. But because of Jesus, because of the true and better Joshua, it's not just one superstar, Moses, who gets to experience the presence of God. It's all of us. When we gather here on a Sunday morning, God is with us. His presence fills the room. But you know what? God's presence is with us Monday morning too. You and I are presence carriers of the living God. We need to hear that loud and clear. God would say to us, as he said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And finally, our courage needs to be anchored in the word of God. Be strong, says God to Joshua, and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. We're a people who prioritize the presence of God. We need to be a people who anchor ourselves in living out the word of God. We live in a culture where there is a decreasing recognition of authority. And that creeps into the church. And there's many churches who are giving up on believing the Bible as the word of God. That is not something we are going to do. We're going to hold fast to this book as the word of God. Really, really important. From time to time, God's people get pushed off track by believing a lie. It happened to Eve in the garden. Did God really say? It happened to God's people going into the promised land. Ten spies said, no, it's too difficult. They chose to reject what God had said. But now God reiterates and repeats his promises to Joshua. The land is yours. The whole land. Just step into what God has promised. And God wants to come to you. God wants to come to me this morning and say this. I am bigger than your past mistakes. I'm bigger than your failures. This is a day for fresh faith, a time to find strength, uh, find strength find to fi- a time to find courage, and a time to believe what God has promised. Let's stand, shall we? Maybe this morning... You have never, ever connected with Jesus. You've just been looking in. Can I say to you, living a moral life will never be enough. You will never be enough. I will never be enough. It's only Jesus who is enough. I want to invite you this morning to commit your life to Jesus Christ. He is enough. And for all of us this morning, let's step forwards into fresh encounter, fresh faith, believing all that God has promised. God wants to renew promises to you this morning. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we stand before you as your people. And we do say yes to you this morning. We choose to step into all that you've said. Lord, we believe the book. We believe the promises. 
We believe you, Jesus. Thank you, you are our true and better Joshua. Lord, thank you, it's not about us. It's all about you, Jesus, and what you have achieved. Amen.